Good evening and welcome to Tuning Up with Iggy and Dave here live at the Hawaii Theater Center. And boy, we are in for a treat tonight. Uh, we are joined by a number of guests here on stage. Uh, the first bringing us into the program tonight, Mr. Bill Petty. Thank you so much for joining us here with the theater organ here at the Hawaii Theater Center. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And a special welcome to Norman Foster and James Moffat, two clarinetists here in our orchestra, two thirds of our section. That's and right. of course, Iggy, thank you for joining me. Hi hey everyone. Every week. Hey Dave, how are you? I'm great. I don't think I've ever been played on before. <laughs> it was uh, very sentimental and nostalgic. Thank you very much, Bill. And that was music from the early 30s, you were telling us. Music from the early 30s. Uh, we might call it intermission music. You come into a theater that's romantic like this, you find your seat, you sit back waiting for the movie to start, but you look around kind of in fantasy. The organ helps create that mood. Beautiful, and there's a, a rich history to this theater and this particular your instrument that you're playing here that we're going to get here to momentarily. Uh, but a few things as we start, uh, we want to remind you that you can, and we invite you to join in the conversation this evening by texting the number on your screen, 808-528-0506. Uh, text us your questions. We will be doing a quiz shortly. Uh, our quiz is about the organ, actually, this evening. Um, and uh, I think we'll have another, a couple other questions, uh, well, maybe for the audience. You we know, with, I, we're never prepared for this show, so I never know what's going on. Oh, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very prepared this evening, because with Halloween approaching and our performance on Halloween, and, you know, people like to dress up this time of year. And, you know, I've heard rumors that maybe Iggy has been known to come in costume to a performance. That was in my previous life. Previous Dave. life, okay. <laughs> well, speaking of that concert, our, our upcoming performance is on October 31st, on Halloween. And one of the pieces on the program will be Albinoni's, what is it, Serenade for Strings and Organ? Can, Adagio? Adagio, thank you. Yes, it's, I knew it was something slow. Um, <laughs> And we will be featuring this beautiful instrument. And so Bill is joining us tonight to give us a little preview of this instrument to tell us about the history, uh, which is very unique. So Bill, tell us about the theater organ and maybe how it's different than the church organ we, we might be accustomed to. Yeah, well, um, a lot of it has to do with, with the organist and the style that they're playing. And it'll be played quite differently with the symphony. But a theater organ has a different tonal architecture to it than a typical classical organ. You might think of Bach, uh, a Bach concert at church, that sort of thing, when you think of a church organ. A theater organ is all about entertainment, uh, playing lighthearted, uh, light classics, and popular music of the day from the 1920s, 1930s. And it, uh, it has uh, a lot of resources to do that. And, and uh, it has, uh, if, if we use the term vibrato with uh, other instruments, this has what we call tremulance. Uh, and it has a multiple set of tremulance for the, all the sets of the pipes in the organ to give it that big, robust sound. And so in playing for the entertainment uh, type of sound, it was initially needed to accompany silent movies. These were in the theaters during the 1920s, the golden era of silent movies. The organ would be the, the console, the part that we play. The organist is situated right where they can watch the screen and, and play along and play themes for each of the uh, different characters, the different scenes, the different moods that are happening. They can underscore and punctuate the sound, uh, with sounds of the organ the action that's happening on the screen. Well, they play, play, play all through the whole, through the whole picture, and then uh, it's done. The lights come up, and they start playing intermission music. Now, back in the day, there would be vaudeville performers on this stage. So the organist would uh, sometimes have something worked out with those performers. Maybe there'd be a juggler, maybe some dancers, that sort of thing. They would need some musical accompaniment. The organist would just lend to that part of the entertainment. And, and uh, the audience was very accustomed to hearing an organ. 
organs historically have been in prominent buildings uh, throughout uh, um, the northern hemisphere. Uh, there's many um, other locations. Uh, concert halls have grand pipe organs. There's even some uh, uh, town halls that have pipe organs. Back in the day of uh, early assemblance of great groups of people, you would need a lot of acoustical energy to fill the place, and you'd need a big orchestra. Well, maybe you can't always have the orchestra in there whenever you want, but the organ, if it's always there, you just need an organist to come in and turn it on and play it, and it would fill, fill the room with uh, uh, sufficient sound. So you, you talk about the, the needs of, of an instrument to, like this to create similar sounds to the orchestra. One could never replace the orchestra with an organ. Awesome. Uh, I think our, our, our union would have something to say about that, thankfully. Um, and what is it that drives this instrument? Is it wind or is it air? Well, we call it wind. wind. It's dynamic, it's moving, and it uh, is made available from a turbine blower down in the basement, and it's ducted up into the organ chambers, and it's controlled from wiring that emanates from the console here. And this technology was all worked out uh, many, many years ago, uh, before the turn of the century. It's part of the Industrial Revolution, right. if you will, from the late 1800s. Well, when, when motion pictures came into prominence and it, they were more than just a, a passing fancy, there was money to be made in exhibition of motion pictures and you needed to su sufficiently entertain people. Small neighborhood theaters would have had a, a piano and a violinist and when they get creative they add a drummer, but theaters need to be bigger and bigger and the downtown theaters they would have an orchestra pit and an orchestra, but it soon became evident that if they had an organ they could cover all their needs sufficiently and s sadly the, the musicians, the, the orchestra musicians were not needed so much because the organ could in many ways fulfill the needs of accompanying the, the picture, it could accompany the live performers on stage and it could always provide the entertainment of uh, intermission music. Certainly. We're getting a few questions here already. Thank you so much. And, and one of these is actually about the, the history of this particular instrument. Now, was this built for this theater or, or was it built some other place? You know, as I've conducted many, many tours here in this theater, the favorite question people like to ask is, is this the original organ? Well, no, it's not, but it's a twin to the original. There was an organ in this theater when it opened in September of 1922 and it looked very much like this. It was from the same company, the Robert Morton Company. It had four keyboards, and uh, that organ was here up until 1938, entertaining audiences here. It was removed and went away. This organ is just from uh, a block and a half away from the Princess Theater. The Princess Theater was demolished in 1969. This organ was rescued by some volunteers and taken out of that theater just in time, brought over here and reinstalled. Wonderful. So that's the, that's the short story of this organ. Wonderful, well we're so lucky to have it here and uh, I think this brings us to uh, a really good time for, for two things. The first of all, uh, these organs don't maintain themselves, uh, nor do theaters. And so this is the pitch, uh, this is the moment where I say, please help the Hawaii Theater Center uh, help Bill, uh, help Greg, <laughs> make sure that this instrument stays in working condition uh, because we're going to use it with the orchestra. Okay. And, you know, it, is, it, it never will replace the orchestra. Uh, but, you know, it is something that is really unique to the history of Hawaii here and the history of this theater that uh, we really must maintain. So, now, you talk about this instrument being moved from another theater. Um, now, what percentage are we seeing at the moment of this instrument, would you say? Here on stage. Very... Oh, what, what you're seeing is the console. Yes. The console is the control center for the pipes. The pipes are in organ chambers on either side of the house, house left, house right. 
and they were all individually moved over here. Everything had to be rounded up uh, and and uh, keep track of all the inventory of everything and all the attendant parts and pieces, all of the chests that the pipes sit on, all the reservoirs that are intermediary, and many, many pieces of hardware. And these were uh, volunteers back then who just had to figure out a, a system, a method of doing it, put a piece of tape on this and a piece of tape on that and put A goes to B and, and they got it over here. It took them three years to get it put back together, wow. but they did it. Wow, so you, you've mentioned the, 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 num the uh, size of the instrument, that there's, there's quite a few pipes involved, and I think that takes us to, to a, maybe a good quiz to question, the wine question this evening. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, we have our wonderful sponsorship with Kaka'ako Wines. Uh, we're drinking a, a beautiful uh, 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon. You're drinking. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting. I, I, yeah, Norm's drinking. <laughs> uh, thank you, Norm. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think we, we have a bottle that we're going to send out uh, this week. Uh, and the, the quiz question this evening is approximately, uh, we'll use round numbers, approximately how many pipes are here. Oh, here's even a photo for you. You can start <laughs> counting. How many pipes are involved in the use of this organ within the, that's housed here at the Hawaii Theater Center. So text your answer uh, to the number below on your screen. And you know, we have another photo that I think we can pull up here as well. We talked about, you talked about the blower uh, that is uh, making the yeah, wind. It's, uh, it's, it's down in the basement. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, we're looking at a, a Westinghouse motor, a three-phase motor that's nearly 100 years old on a Spencer turbine machine has 40 inch diameter fans. This is the largest such blower in the state of Hawaii. Wow, and here I thought that, uh, that Greg Dunn was downstairs <laughs> pumping that by hand to make all that, uh, all that wind for the instrument. But uh, that's quite the mechanics there to make this work. So, so that, that's, that's where the wind starts from. And it, when, it, when you hear it play, this is all an acoustic sound. Yeah. It's, uh, it's that wind pressure that has been carefully controlled and coming through the no pipes that funny. now emanates into the house. Beautiful. Bill, um, I just had a quick question. I remember a couple of years ago we had uh, Cameron Carpenter perform a soloist with the, um, with the symphony and yes. you actually helped us service the organ and I don't know how much time you spent but, uh, but uh, you, you had a great deal for, to do and uh, the, the success of that concert was uh, thanks to you. Um, you mentioned silent movies. Um, did the movie have a music score, or was that up to the organ player to just play along with the music? And there, was a, there was a mix of both. Organists were very much tasked to just improvise on their own from all the years of piano lessons that they had had previously to now uh, improvise some music for something. But the studios, like Paramount and uh, United Artists that, that put on some very epic movies, they commissioned scores and that sheet music would travel with the rolls of film to the theater. And you see such a big music rack up here on the console, well, they would stretch out many, many sheets of uh, music of the score to uh, follow along with that if, as they could. It would have suggestions of themes. It would have recommendations of, of uh, tonal characteristic to help emphasize certain points in the movie. And I've, I've seen some of that sheet music. It's very rare. It's very rare. Interesting. How fun. Yeah, we actually have someone joining us from, from DC that actually asked if this was the instrument that was installed at Old Princess Theater, the one in downtown Waikiki. Yes, it is. They remember as a child hearing this organ at the Princess while watching movies. Oh. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us. That it's is, so cool to, to all that's the way amazing. to Washington, D.C. That's amazing to have wow. that connection. Yeah. Well, Bill, we really appreciate you joining us this evening. And I, I, I bet we could do a whole feature on this organ and all the experience you have <laughs> with it. But uh, will you join us a little bit at the end and play a bit more for us? Certainly. Wonderful. Thank <laughs> you so much. And on over to two wind players. Yes, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to welcome Jim and Norm because usually... <laughs> When we have uh, 
colleagues of the symphony come and join us, they're always much younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know who's on first and what's on second, but uh, uh, who joined the, 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 the symphony first? Was it Jim or, or Norm? It Jim. was, yeah. Yeah. But do you have a lot in common, actually. So we'll get to the symphony, but before sure. both of you arrived to Hawaii, uh, there's a history. Can you just uh, tell us quickly about it? Sure. Go ahead. Go Why don't you start, Jim? Well, okay. I, I can speak for me. I know I started my private clarinet lessons in the fall of 1967, the year the Cardinals won the World Series. And then um, about a year later, my teacher thought I was good enough to play in clarinet ensembles that he organized. And he threw me together in a quartet. And one of the members of the quartet was Norm Foster. Uh, so a quartet of four clarinets. Yeah, I know. I'm it's sorry. Scary. It's <laughs> scary, isn't it? it, it but yes, we, back in those days, we referred, we thought of quartets as And again, where was that again? That was in Champaign, Illinois. I was from Urbana, but the lessons were in Champaign. Were, were both you parents somewhat involved uh, with the university, or? Norms were. My father was a professor of art at the University of Illinois. But my parents were friends with your parents. Right. And they used to go to the CU Symphony together. That's the Champaign-Urbana Symphony. Sure. Right. The Champaign-Urbana Symphony. His That's... father was a great artist. And later in his career, he did terrific metal collages, which I thought were fantastic. And his mother was a great pianist. Fantastic. I, I've been to Champaign-Urbana once, I think, because I, I attended uh, Indiana University, and there was a there was a scholarship uh, audition that uh, um, Urbana was, was hosting. And, and I, I, I remember I wasn't driving at that time. I had to ask a friend to drive me from Bloomington, Indiana to Champaign. And I think we made it there. We <laughs> barely made it back. I think his car broke down. But, oh, my. Uh, it was uh, oh, that's a wonderful <laughs> as a memory. newcomer to the US, it was a very interesting landscape. and, and, and uh, uh, sort of like did it, did it <laughs> change? Did the landscape change much? It, it, in the it was very green. Yeah. Okay, you were there that um, time of year. Good. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, so I remember having a, a nice experience. Now we talked about the organ being a wind. Yeah. That's what he said. A wind yeah. instrument. Wind Not instrument. air. Not With, air. I believe so, reeds. Don't the reeds yes, in, in the yeah. pipes of the some, organ vibrate yeah. because of the wind? Sure. We don't want to so, give away the number of pipes. <laughs> I don't have any idea, but I, I suspect you, it's less than a Google. Less than, <laughs> Norm, uh, how, what drew you to, to the clarinet uh, beside the, the clarinet qu uh, quartet with Jim? <laughs> okay, good question. Um, I wanted to play the cello originally because my brother played the violin. That's right. And I, I liked that. You know Dan. I know Dan very well. And, but I wanted to play something similar, but not exactly the same. So my mother arranged to have a cello lesson with a university professor. And I had a cello lesson, and it just wasn't, it didn't How old feel you? comfortable. I was nine. And so I decided, OK, not the cello. And so my mother knew of a very good clarinet teacher in town, and she suggested, well, why don't you play the clarinet? I didn't even know what a clarinet was, <laughs> um, hardly at that age. So I said, OK, I'll try it. And so we ordered a clarinet, a Bundy instrument, for $50. <laughs> and my father, who had played clarinet when he was a boy, knew how to put it together and put the reed on. And so that's how I started on the clarinet. You mentioned reed. Uh, reed. What is a reed? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, it's um, cane that is usually grown in southern France, where you're from, France. <laughs> and um, it is uh, a, a special type of, of wood that has very fine fibers. And if you cut it to a certain shape where the tip is very thin, then when you attach it to the mouthpiece and blow through it, it vibrates and creates a nice tone. Now there's the double reed of the bassoon and oboe. Bassoon but and the oboe. Clarinet they have clarinet is different. The, the the reeds, the two pieces of wood are together in a double reed, and on the clarinet you have a reed by itself with a mouthpiece, and those two vibrate together. And how many clarinets are there? <laughs> you mean how, how in long the state of got? Hawaii right now? <laughs> Well, you know, no, there, there's a whole family there's of There's a whole family of instruments, yeah. yes. You know, sure. it's, it's not, it's similar to the violin, viola, cello, but. Right. 
So for an orchestral player, um, which Jim and I are predominantly orchestral yeah. players, we have a B flat, um, C and A clarinets, those are the soprano instruments. And then my position in the orchestra is E flat clarinet, which is the smaller one, it's like the piccolo mm -hmm. of the clarinet. And then Jim um, is the bass clarinetist of the orchestra. Um, but below that we have the contrabass clarinet and there's even um, an A flat sopranino clarinet, right. really um, which is a really tiny instrument that's almost never played, but it does exist. And do, there are some famous pieces that utilize that instrument that our audience might know. I can't think of them offhand, but what type of music are those, the higher clarinets used for? Okay, so Symphony Fantastique, yeah. which we opened this, the uh, concert, the uh, season with um, this season, yeah. uh, has a famous E flat clarinet solo That's what I was in thinking. it. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great E flat clarinet solos. There's the Till Eulen Spiegel, yeah. and all of the Mahler symphonies have wonderful E flat clarinet parts. And Bolero is another famous one. Now. Um, Mozart, I've heard of him. Was important <laughs> in the growth of the clarinet, but he, there, he asked he for basset horn in the record. Can you? What is a basset horn, and uh, why well, is it played by the clarinet? Okay, first of all, I have to say Norm's one of the best E flat clarinet players I know. So he's he's awesome. Jim's one of the best um, basset horn players I know. <laughs> <laughs> so well, he's uh, the expert on the basset horn. As you as you say, and stop me if I go too long. But his, the Mozart's clarinetist that he wrote everything for, one of his Masonic brothers in Vienna there, Anton Stadler, he was experimenting with the clarinet because it was early in its growth. And I don't want to get too technical unless it's a quiz question, but he, <laughs> the clarinet does not end, <clears throat> the bottom register of the clarinet does not extend to its tonic note. And so he um, had a, a maker make all of his clarinets go down to the tonic note. Basically, we stop at written low, C, low E, but he had it extend down to the C. So if you're playing a low C on a B flat clarinet, it sounds like a B flat on the A clarinet. And so there were um, instruments slightly below the clarinet. You might call them an alto or tenor clarinet. There was a, 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 the A clarinet I mentioned, which is still used today. And then there was a basset horn in G, which is just a slightly longer instrument then a basset horn in F, another slightly longer instrument, and they kept trying to find out how to get um, an instrument sound an octave below the B flat or A clarinet, but the technology in those days didn't allow it. So they took tubes and, kind of like the bassoon in modern day, which is, features a U-tube, but they would devise all kinds of things to extend the pipe that would go this way and that and around and finally come out so they could get the lower pitches. So Stadler had this low C on all his instruments, and when he played the one in F or one in G, it was just called the basset horn, which means small instrument or basset clarinet. And all Mozart's writings after the late 1780s have extended parts in it, like the concerto, the Very famous good. quintet. Well, you're lucky that uh, Mozart wrote great things for the, the instrument. I, I think he, he named the organ as the king of the instruments. <laughs> I, I, I heard Absolutely. that he wasn't crazy about the flute, but uh, he wrote great things that about may the, a, that. May be a the, myth, the that flute thing. Like, I, probably a myth. But the, yeah, the concerto, clarinet concerto is the last, last concerto he finished, right. The, I just got another very interesting fact about Kane and the organ. <laughs> and actually, the wood in the chamber room for this organ is made of cane wood. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. You Absolutely. know, several of my colleagues in the Spring Wind Quintet tried to harvest some cane in upcountry Maui to see if they could start a uh, reed making business from Hawaii cane, but it wasn't quite the same density that would work. That's why Norm mentioned southern France. That appears to be the ideal location for all of that. It reminds me of when I was a, a kid in, in, in France studying at the conservatory. Uh, my, my friends uh, who play clarinet, they had uh, their little pack of cigarettes, and then they had the little pack of where all the clarinet reeds were, so right. sometimes yeah. they would get confused. But anyway. <laughs> so, how. Um, we're going to skip a little bit, maybe we'll come back, but uh, how did the two of you end up uh, playing in the same orchestra here? Did you, were you, was that pure coincidence? Did you stay in touch or what happened? Well, yeah, we, we stayed okay, in touch. Okay, well, Go I ahead. think I have an answer to that. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, but please wait. jump in at any, at any moment. 
Um, Jim got the job in 1981. That's right. And I remember when he um, had the job because he and I were actually in Paris together playing at the um, International Clarinet Conference in Paris that year in 1981 in a clarinet choir that we played together. That's another story. <laughs> and so at the end of that conference, I remember you said you were flying to Honolulu right. to play in the Honolulu Symphony. Right. And I thought that was very, very cool. I was playing in Hong Kong at the time in the Hong Kong Philharmonic oh. Orchestra. And um, being from the same hometown, we would get together during the summers and go have pool duty over at the, um, the pool at the university, uh, swim laps and, and talk. Oh, okay. I thought and I so, <laughs> jury duty. <laughs> like jury duty, except we called it pool duty. And that was when you mentioned to me that there was um, an opening right. in the Honolulu Symphony. Right. I think it was for principal clarinet. That's true, 1983, right. spring of 83. And so I Who decided oh. that I would audition for that. Orioles and so and I auditioned, I flew over from Hong Kong, and I stayed at your place. That's right. And we both auditioned for the right. job, and neither of us got the job. Right, which was perfect. Um, <laughs> and, but that was my introduction to Hawaii and the Honolulu Symphony. And so subsequently there was a one-year position that I auditioned for, and I didn't win. And then the third time I auditioned was the second and E-flat position. Um, right. And that was the position that I won. So it was kind of a long process, um, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess third time's the charm. As All they I can say. tell you is that I was the only eligible clarinet representative. Bachelor. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the only eligible clarinet representative on the audition committee that year, and we had a kind of taped resume system. So candidates would send in tapes to us and we would determine whether we wanted to hear them live or whether they were qualified to audition. Almost everybody was, especially the guy that sent in a tape from some somewhere with an ambulance going by in the middle of his slow, soft excerpts. Was but it I, a, a siren or yeah. was it a oh, yeah. European ambulance? It was, it was a steady <laughs> siren, American siren. Anyway, so I listened to 175 tapes and I, I narrowed it down to 10 that I wanted to hear again, so I listened to those and then from there pared it down. I think overall I listened, if you count all the times I listened to tapes multiple times, about 210 tapes. And I selected several and we invited them to audition. And after, um, and, and at the audition for Norm's job, uh, after he played the Mozart concerto from memory in the days before a screen, so it was very impressive to our committee. We went to Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York and heard terrific players all over the country. And Norm played in Chicago, and he played the Mozart, and everyone was, wow. And then he played one excerpt, and the music director leaned over to me, and he said, you know, this guy is so good. Let's just advance him. So I said, great. So the personal magic goes, thank you. <laughs> and he'll tell you the story, but. Um, well, I thought I was. Usually, I thought that when was someone said thought thought was, was out. <laughs> yeah. right. Usually, when Usually someone says thank you after a couple excerpts. Right. But right. Norm. Did, so, so I was getting ready to, to pack up and, and leave the hotel. I thought, you know, I thought I was, I was cut. And which, you know, it happened several times before in, in other auditions that I had taken. So I was used to that. I almost expected it. <laughs> um, and I was, of course, disappointed. But um, then I think Jeff, was it Jeff Neville? Jeff Neville, now personnel who, manager of the Los um, Angeles came up to me on. and right. said, you know, don't leave, don't leave. You know, we'd like to invite you back. So. Um, so I came back and played in the finals at that point. He was clearly, he was terrific, did a great job. And when I went back and was allowed to see who had played on what tapes, his was clearly a top one. So he was really great. Well, just, be, so. just before uh, Dave chimes in, <laughs> we, we talked about audition before, mm -hmm. live auditions. But I know for me, uh, if I have to listen to a lot of tapes, this is the most grueling process because I find that in the morning when my mind is fresh and I listen to tapes, I may have, uh, and depending on the order of the tapes I'm listening to, um, I'll have a, um, I'll have made up my mind. Then later in the day, if I listen to those tapes again, then everything goes out the window, and I have a different judgment. So um, you need to kind of listen to the same tapes over a, a few times. It's just, uh, you know, you, you, it's like when you have too much wine, right, Dave? When, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> uh, when you're tasting too many wines after a while, you get so much saturation, it's just hard to uh, 
to decipher. <clears throat> Excuse me, I didn't, it didn't come out very well. <laughs> so you both have been in the orgs for quite some time, and, and I've been in situations. Actually, I'm, I'm reminiscing at uh, about back in January, and I was sitting with these three exact people uh, in the interview process for, right. for for this position. I mean, this is this is the you have them to thank or blame for this. Um, <laughs> and you know, I'm I'm thinking back to the the all the things we've talked about. You know, the ups and downs of this orchestra. What are the real the highs? What are those performances? Those muse, those conductors that you've worked with. Uh, you know, those archival recordings that we've been having conversations right. about, trying to release some of those, because uh, there's so much history of classical music with, with, with the orchestra here. So what are you, both of you what, are you, what are your favorites? For me, one of my favorite experiences was when Seiji Ozawa conducted sure. the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. That was really, really exciting, because that was one of my favorite pieces when I was growing up, actually. Um, I think it was a Chicago Symphony recording that we used to listen to, my brother and I. Um, what about for you, Jim? I would agree with that concert. That you, was, you played in that concert, too. I did. That what was, year and, and that date was, was that? That was February 27th, 1988. Um, and we did the Bartok, and then we did the Beethoven Seventh Symphony after intermission. We started the concert with the Bartok. And that was just a really, I think it sold out in a matter of hours when they announced it. And it was a really terrific thing. It was during opera season. I think we were doing Cavaliero, Aristocana, and Pagliacci. And so we had, the, we had um, Friday night, opening night of performance. The stage was struck, and we were put in for a dress rehearsal on Saturday morning, did the concert with Ozawa on Saturday night, and then they struck us again and moved the, um, moved the opera set back in, and we did an opera matinee the next day. And we did the rehearsals before that right here. Their theater was not renovated at that time, and it was a very interesting scenario, especially with Maestro Ozawa conducting us, but um, it turned out to be a terrific, an amazing evening, really. And it he came amazing. back in early 1995 and did another concert with us, mm -hmm. um, and that, that was, was also very good. fifth? On that one, Beethoven and, five? Uh, Tchaikovsky, yeah. 1812. 1812, I believe we did Afternoon of a Fawn, uh, the WC Prelude that time. That was really great too. I think this stands out as uh, as my favorite. As a highlight. Do mm -hmm. you remember when Sarah Chang? I hear she sort of made her very early starts here. 1992. I don't know I how think. old she was. Uh, I think it was 1992. We did nine the or ten years old or something. Or I mean, something like that. Pretty. Do you remember her? Because she came uh, later, of course, a couple times with mm -hmm. us and. Um, when she was well established, but I think that was really the beginning. She did the Tchaikovsky concerto with us. Yes, definitely. I remember that very well. Mm -hmm. that was what about um, Takemitsu, the Japanese composer? Was that maybe before your yes, time? Yes, that was before. Believe it or not, that was before my time. And I know <laughs> definitely before your time, which uh, I wish I would have been here, but was 1970-something uh, when Kachaturian came? October 1977, yes. At that time, the associate principal cellist, Alexander Borisov, got Kachaturian out here. And he was sick at the time, according to my colleagues who yeah, played it, and died yeah. shortly thereafter. Right. But yeah, the mayor, Mayor Fossey, declared it Kachaturian week. In wow. Honolulu. That was a very, very big deal. Yeah, it's a really wonderful composer from Armenia. Of course, now, mm -hmm. nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, most famous person from Armenia is Kardashian. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I think in our How world, times probably have Kachaturian yes. uh, was, was any other memories that, because uh, I joined maybe in the late 90s, but I was curious about that, uh, that you know, 80s, 90s, any other experience, any memories that you have of the orchestra? Well, there were tremendous experiences in those days. We did a Mahler something every year. We did all 10 symphonies. We did song cycles and uh, Shostakovich symphonies. Um, remember when we did Shostakovich Eighth with Andrew Lytton? Do you remember That's that? That's right, I do. And that was incredible. There's a bass clarinet solo towards the end after it's a very kind of war-centric piece. And then the bass clarinet's the first thing after this humongous cacophony. And he told me, I have to pretend I'm the cockroach, the first cockroach after the nuclear explosion. So that was a really great... Um, <laughs> Feeling? <laughs> very memorable. <laughs> that was a really great uh, thing. It was just, it was always terrific. Um, the, the, my first week in the orchestra, we did an all Shostakovich concert at the Shell with Maxim and his son. 
Maxim Shostakovich, mm -hmm. the yes. son of the well, son, of, son of the composer and the composer's grandson, playing the second piano concerto. And the next season, we started with Andre Watts playing all of Tchaikovsky at the Shell. Just really amazing, amazing orchestra stuff. You know, week so, in and week out, we we have a number of of people join us from the other islands. Talk about the history of the orchestra off of Wahoo. Sure. Well, I think one of the things that I noticed right away when I got here, which of course was many years ago, uh, was the, in general, the great outreach we had. Mm -hmm. at, at the time, we had a four Saturday series at the Shell, every Saturday in August. And it was a great thing, because families could sit on the lawn, you could watch or listen to the concert from the seating area, and up front was a catered dinner for high-end donors, and that was really terrific, but during the week, we would do, uh, my first several years, 12 community outreach concerts on Oahu throughout, throughout the island, paid for by city and county funding. They were free. We frequently had guest conductors from the audience come up and conduct something with us. It was just a lot of fun. And coupled with that was our really all-encompassing neighbor island presence. We had a, a um, a tour usually at, well there was a we open we used to open the Kahilu theater every year their season every year in the fall and then we'd spend a week there on the Kona coast and then we would be in residence at the UH Hilo in the spring so another week there then we'd spend similar time on Kauai we'd go to Maui I remember when they actually flew the orchestra well I'm sure it happened more than before me but I remember they flew us to Molokai High School we did a full orchestra youth concert there on, I went to Lanai my first year, flew there, played on Kalapapa my first year, an ensemble there. And when I was lobbying for the state legislative funding, which really helped secure a lot of that, I remember one of the neighbor island reps asked us to provide a list of the schools that we serviced, either by them bringing a class into one of our youth programs or us sending an ensemble to the school. It turns out we were accessing every neighbor island school that way. Not every classroom, but every school had some sort of access to the orchestra. That coupled with our Oahu outreach, I remember one, one time we had 5,000 people on the beach up at uh, Haleiwa Beach Park. Uh, it was great. We did 1812 up there, remember that, with Cannon up there? Yeah. So it was <laughs> really a, a great, great thing. It was wow. really terrific, really great, those tours. What a great way of, of great interaction with yes. all of all of Hawaii and being exactly. represent, a representation of of our entire community here. Uh, something that I I hope is we can travel again uh, and uh, get back out and, and do those things uh, for that our community. So uh, a question for Norm. <laughs> sure. Uh, you're not always a classical clarinetist. That's true. What? Your, your musical talent uh, goes far beyond. Tell us about it. And, and please, can, are you still performing on Wednesday evenings? Yes. Great. So we'll, okay. you'll have to share that as yeah. well. Thank you for, yeah. for mentioning that. I'll start there and work yeah. my way back maybe. Um, but um, my wife, Ruth, and I have a show that we do every Wednesday evening. It's called 7 at 7 Wednesdays. Uh, it's FaceTime live. And um, we do seven songs starting at seven o'clock. <laughs> and um, she's a singer and she plays keyboard and ukulele. And I play the clarinet. And occasionally I play the bass clarinet. Um, I think once I played the E flat clarinet. Um, we did an arrangement of the um, pink elephant. Uh, wait. Baby elephant. Baby walk. elephant. Henry Baby Man elephant. Henry walk. Mancini. I don't know. I'm, I'm mixing up Pink Panther and the baby elephant. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. There you go. Your um, next arrangement. So, um, but we do a variety of jazz, pop, originals, um, uh, Hawaiian, and some classical yeah. um, music. And in fact, um, we're doing a little bit of Piazzolla these days, which is one of Iggy's favorite composers. So I think tomorrow evening we're doing um, Libre Tango. And the previous week we did Street Tango okay. by um, Piazzolla. Anyway, so in addition to that, um, I play with a gypsy jazz group called Gypsy 808. And um, that's one of my favorite bands. And because of the situation, we haven't played together for a while. But um, 
there's, I guess there's quite a few videos on YouTube yeah. of us um, over the past maybe 10 years that we've been together. And um, that's music that is um, inspired by, well, I, I would say Django Reinhardt started that style of music with um, the famous violinist Stefan Grappelli mm -hmm. in Paris, France. And so guitar and violin um, with bass and some other guitarists playing uh, ry uh, rhythm guitar is, is the style of music that was uh, invented in the late 30s and the 1940s in Paris, France. But there's been a, a kind of a resurgence here in the United States, well, around the world, I should say. Um, so Gypsy 808 is kind of our, our version of that. Um, mm -hmm. Clarinet was, was one of the um, important instruments back in the 40s. Uh, for that style of music, which was usually two or three guitars, bass, uh, violin, and clarinet. And did you did you grow up uh, listening to that genre? <laughs> How did you? Um, not so much. Did you have to train, or did it come naturally? Uh, it did not come naturally. Um, I grew up very much a classical player, a reader, not playing very much by ear, not improvising. Um, I always liked jazz ever since I was uh, in high school. But I didn't really learn or study jazz until later in life. So when Gypsy Jazz, when I heard that style of music with the clarinet, I thought, OK, that's for me. Um, so that's how I got into it. And learning to improvise, learning to bend pitch, and, and all of those sorts of things, how, did that, how does that apply to then playing Mozart, for example? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, so I think that um, learning to improvise and play in these different styles where you, you explore different colors and tones and, and different reads, that, that can inform how you play Mozart. Um, and so you, you, know, you want to play music so that it sounds fresh. Mm, yeah. Even if every single note is written down and you have to play those notes, you still want it to sound new and fresh and somewhat improvised. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Mozart's day, improvisation was part of the style. Yeah. The cadenzas were, were improvised. Um, and so it's nice to, to, to see the connection between um, the music of today that's improvised that came from music of the past, mm -hmm. which has some improvisation in, in the, the development of it, in fact. Absolutely. I mean, Bach was known to sit down and improvise fugues. Yeah. You know, <laughs> how cool is that? It's a good thing he wrote a lot of them down. Yeah. Jim, just, you're going to say? I'll just do very quickly. Um, when I was in graduate school, Norm was an undergrad, and I constantly tried to get him to go hear jazz performances with me. I saw Duke Ellington twice. I saw Thad Jones, Mel Lewis Band, Charlie Mingus, Dizzy Gillespie, and he would say, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I can't. I'm, i got to stay home and practice my right. <laughs> Mozart concerto or whatever. <laughs> he's a genius. So well, he's, Norm, it was through you, actually, that I got to meet some, some wonderful players and friends of yours. I mean, I've, I've met your brother, a violinist. I also met Perry Karp and, sure. and his whole family, uh, a right. wonderful cellist. Um, and so you equally jazz, symphony, you, you love chamber music. Um, and you know I, you've had festivals in, in the past before. Mm -hmm. uh, chamber music, Jim, that's something very dear to you as well. You've been involved with Chamber Music Hawaii for quite a number of years. 1986, that's right. By Tell the way, I went bit. to high school with Perry Karp. He was in my German class. And Perry Karp's brother <laughs> is an epidemiologist, is that correct? Epidemiologist, but also a very fine violinist oh. and, pianist. and pianist. And so I know right. during those, uh, uh, this pandemic, uh, uh, Norm, uh, you've been in touch with his brother, and I've been in touch with him <laughs> through Perry because we all have questions, right? right. right. But anyway, um, sorry, Jim, so I, I, I understand mask. you have a concert, but hey, tell us about uh, Chamber Music Hawaii a little bit. It's an um, organization that was founded in the, in the early 80s uh, with various different musicians who made up several different groups. They formed a string quartet, a woodwind quartet, and a brass quartet. And then they formed their own governance structure and their own organization so that they could play chamber music concerts on their own. And you're and the president? Or? I'm the president of the board, yeah. So you're the president of the board of Chamber Music Hawaii. Uh -huh. You're the president of the union? Just right now, yeah. You're accomplished and very busy 
a clarinet player. And, and Norm, also, I, I, I used to have some of you postcards. You, you draw very wow. well. Terrific. Um, I mean, you're so busy and you're so multi-talented. Uh, do you find that sometimes just playing a, a simple scale on the clarinet is, uh, cleans, is, cleans your palate of all the... Absolutely. One of my favorite things to teach students is to play a C scale going down and then play it again to this rhythm. And if you do those two things together, you come up with one of the most famous melodies ever. <laughs> this is a quiz for the audience. It kind of is a quiz. <laughs> yeah. But my students, I love the look on their face about halfway through playing the, the scale coming down to that rhythm because they know the tune. I don't know what it is. Don't look at me. <laughs> I, I have to internalize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, Someone you can try it in your head. Maybe yeah. we'll have Bill. We'll do it on the organ. We'll yeah. have Bill play it. Speaking of crazy things. <laughs> we, I don't think we quite have a correct answer yet, do we, Greg? No. The, the correct answer has, has not been given. It's not been given um, yet. Is it going to have to be the closest number? It might have to be the closest number. Um, you know, the other thing that we could do is, you know, um, as I mentioned earlier, it is Halloween. I don't mean to take away from our conversation Not that we, we're going a big giant <laughs> left turn here. Um, <laughs> what should Iggy come dressed as next week for <laughs> Halloween? Um, I feel like the best answer might get the bottle of wine. Uh, <laughs> I think that next week on Tuning Up, we're going to have Jeffrey Bachman join us, who will be conducting our uh, Sweet Psycho Suite performance. Uh, and what better opportunity than uh, maybe a suggestion from Dave? our- How about Dave? What about you? You maybe should wear- OK, maybe for both of us. You could suggest costumes for, for both of us. Um, <laughs> but uh, the answer for the organ is uh, more than 10,000 and less than 20,000. So uh, that narrows it down a little bit. Okay, okay. So, that's a, a good hint. Uh, I, I, you know, Jim, I did have a question for you because sure. something that people don't know and realize is I know you're, you can be very hard on yourself because I, you know, I'm backstage, I hear right. you practice or and we have concerts myself, right? and, and, and maybe like, Two, three times a year, I'll, I'll, I'll hear someone <laughs> yell at himself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think it's very human. You know, we're Definitely. we're not we're fallible. We, we you know. We That's hate. for sure. And, and <laughs> as performers, um, no doubt. And and frankly, I've I've heard you play very well, and I it's fine. But you you still manage to find something that you right, weren't happy right, with. Right, right. Tell us uh, what what happens or. <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting because it happens to all of us, and we, we, we manage it differently. Yeah, everyone does uh, their own thing. But yeah. in your way, sometimes I've heard you kind of, uh, well, I, I get the, the earth myself. was shaking once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just feel that uh, I would like to play as well as I possibly can. Don't we all? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's just I try to uh, focus that. And uh, if it works or to my satisfaction, which is never, then I'm happy. And if it doesn't, I... Try to figure out how to make it better next time. Hopefully, there'll be a next time for us at some point. Well, in speaking of that, you know, you we just talked about Chamber Music Hawaii, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that there's a performance coming up on Saturday here. Actually, a live stream performance. We actually taped it, but uh, yes, so yes, mm -hmm. it will be li it will be live for those who are tuning in. Exactly, and we'll be on, <laughs> on we'll be on live too, so you can talk with us. Ask oh, great, us questions. great. So, can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that program? You played on it. I did. I played a, a, a piece by a Nigerian composer with the Spring Wind Quintet, which is really great. There's uh, some of the Beethoven trio for flute, viola, violin. A lot of really fun stuff on there. And it's a travel-related program, so I'm not sure I'm supposed to give away all of it, but I know our two horn players are uh, doing a railroad motif piece, and it's, uh, it'll be a lot of fun, a light, light thing. And we're thinking about another one in December for the holidays and hopefully something after the first of the year. And hopefully after that, we can start live performances at some point again. But yeah, we try to remain active and try to come up with ideas that can work. Um, our Galliard String Quartet did a, a li actual live stream concert in July. And the Spring Wind was offered one, but we could not find a place where we were allowed to do it um, because of our aerosol. 
situation. I see. I see. So, yeah. Yes. Well, I'm looking forward to tuning into that on, Thanks. on Saturday. Thanks. That'd be great. And, Ask us uh, a question. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we, we have a few more questions that I, I want to get to here. We really appreciate you being involved in this. Uh, a question for both of you. What are your hopes and dreams for the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra and classical music in Hawaii in the coming years? Just a light. Well, uh, of course, getting back on stage with the full orchestra and playing the um, live scores to some of the great movies, the Harry Potter series and so forth, um, but, but also the, the great standard repertoire. And uh, of course, the operas that we do, getting back into the pit and playing for the Hawaii Opera Theater has always been just a great thing to do. Um, so um, getting back to, you know, doing what we were doing before, um, safely, of course, um, and we anticipate that those days will come, uh, although it is challenging at, at this time. Um, I, I also would hope that we would be able to do um, m more from home in the safety of our homes, uh, whatever we can do and, and put out there digitally, I think is a great thing. Um, you know, whether it's a solo or a small group putting it together or even the full orchestra. Some orchestras have done those, those large group um, playing from home um, uh, uh, things and putting it out there. Um, so I, I hope that some of the things, some of the new things that we're exploring now will be something that can continue alongside when we get back on stage doing the, the more normal um, ways of performing. Can only make us stronger and more resilient for the future. <laughs> That's right. We, so. we want to emerge stronger from this and we appreciate all the support that we have been getting Absolutely. from our donors yes. um, during this difficult time. Definitely. And I'd love to get our outreach back to what it was and our education program back to what it was in addition to everything. Yeah, that would be terrific. Now, I mentioned before, um, Jim, you're the president of the union. Uh, Norm, you're the chair of the orchestra committee. And you've been here quite a bit. And I, I, I'm guessing that it's important that we, you know, that we, the symphony has so many moving parts, you know, the musicians, the staff, and the, the board, and, and, and the, the, the audience, the volunteers. Mm -hmm. And it's important that, mm -hmm. that we all move in the same direction. And because of your experience, you help everyone understand this? We hope so. I hope so. Um, we could have a sample negotiation right now. No, but, but no, I think uh, that a new door has opened with Dave agreeing to come out, which is fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm just glad you're here because it's been great that we're trying to do something. And we're constantly working a ways that we can find solutions together. That's really the goal. Definitely. If it, if it feels like we're just having a natural conversation, it's because these are the three people <laughs> I talk to the most. Um, in Usually addition over to our, Zoom. our board and 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 our staff, you know, I, I feel very comfortable, and I feel like we are all working uh, together to to find a way forward. And, and um, you know, it, everyone is is quite literally sacrificing to to make sure that there is a symphony here in six months, twelve months, and a year. I guess a 12 months is a year, but um, <laughs> uh, 12 years, I will say. Um, and you know, a lot of that, uh, we're able to do that because of the support of, of you tuning in, uh, for attending our, our streaming broadcasts uh, here for Sounds of Resilience, supporting all of the other arts organizations, the Hawaii Theater Center. Um, this is a very trying time. Uh, and I'm grateful to be in a place where the musicians uh, are so involved in the decision-making process. And uh, little by little, we're, we're getting back to what I hope will be normal and uh, an enhanced version of normal, uh, hopefully very soon here. So and a few more questions before we bring uh, Bill out here. A question for the orchestra and Iggy. Uh, what's the history of Piazzolla's music in Hawaii or your relationship with his music? Why? What is it about Piazzolla? Because we have some coming up in December as well, right? That's right. That's right. Um, well, I grew up in, in, in France, and, and Piazzolla, who had uh, studied in, in, uh, in Paris with Nadia Boulanger, uh, was somewhat famous there already. So I wasn't paying too much attention around that time. There was um, 
uh, w w the time when I grew up in, in Paris was uh, early 80s. Um, but I guess there was something that uh, a seed was maybe planted. And so later on, uh, a lot of classical musicians like to cross over and, and played a lot of their own classical version of tango, which I wasn't that crazy about. Um, and so that's why when I came here, um, when I had the opportunity um, to, to do tango, um, I wanted to learn from the authentic artists. So not you know piano trio arrangements, but actually a bandoneon or bass player or pianist uh, from Argentina. Which actually, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a tie-in to the organ. So in Germany, you had organs in churches, but the churches that were too small to have an organ, they would have this uh, instrument, um, the bandoneon, which looked like an accordion, and the bandoneon um, replaced the organ. And so Piazzolla, Piazzolla him, not me, said that the bandoneon <laughs> made its way from the churches of Germany to the brothers of Argentina. Wow. What a great story. <laughs> I, well, I, I can't wait to hear you play Piazzolla, and you play Piazzolla. That's right. Norm, Norm, please pick up some Piazzolla. Uh, as we Jim, approach okay. the end here, we have to say uh, we, hello to the other third of the clarinet section. Ah. Uh, oh, Lou is there? watching from yes. Portland hi, right Lou. now. Hi, so Lou. Hi, Lou. Hi, Lou. We, we miss you here in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. We sure do. <laughs> well... We have a few people to thank this evening. Uh, first, let's start with Kaka'ako Wines. Uh, again, uh, we have a great partnership with them, uh, and uh, tonight's wine is excellent. It's I'm looking forward excellent. to reaching over to the table. Um, and you'll notice a few uh, compact discs in front of those. Um, those are actually for the performance that's happening here on Saturday at 6 p.m. in advance of the 7.30 p.m. Chamber Music Hawaii. So we have a full evening that's of performance right. for you. Um, this is a project that was done by a cellist in our orchestra, Joshua Nakazawa, um, and Ma his Mana Music Group. And they will be doing a CD release party here at the Hawaii Theater Center uh, at 6 o'clock on Saturday. So lots of really great music happening this weekend and next Friday uh, when we're back here for our own Sounds of Resilience program. Albinoni, Herman... Bernard Herman Psycho. Psycho, yes. Uh, Saint Sans Carnival of the Animals, Caroline Shaw Entracht. Yes. But uh, you know, the uh, uh, Albinoni Adagio is a very famous piece, but was not written by Albinoni, I, I believe. It's, it's, <laughs> anyway, it's very famous. You'll recognize it. Uh, it's so. been in about a dozen, two dozen movies or so. That's right. It was kind of uh, formulated in the 50s. So it's, it's a concert for the young and the old. Absolutely, absolutely. Or the not young and not so young. Yeah. And <laughs> I'll be there. Yeah, <laughs> you will be. We have clarinet. We are That's venturing true. our foot into not just one woodwind, as we mm. had with uh, Scott Janish on the Bach, but that we have terrific. two woodwind players uh, for our next yeah, performance. This, the here. Saint so, yeah, for right. Saint clarinet Saint and flute. Uh, Sue McGinn will be playing. Yeah, the flute. Sue will be joining us. So. You know, little by little, one by yeah. one, uh, we are, are bringing the animals, the woodwinds back, <laughs> the woodwinds back to the, the stage, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, well, before we go here, we'll invite Bill back up to join us at the organ while I thank uh, Gregory Dunn here at the Hawaii Theater Center, Donard Sonoda, our videographer, uh, Bob Dickerson, our, our audio. A special thanks to, to Norm and Jim for, for joining this evening. Sure, our pleasure. And, yeah. Iggy, thank you for thank you, tolerating me again for another Tuesday. <laughs> um, next week, uh, I, I see a lot of recommendations for costumes, Iggy. All so right. you'll want to tune in next Tuesday again for tuning up with, uh, with Iggy. Um, and yes, thank you so much for your support. And uh, nobody got the answer. So the correct answer is about 14,000 pipes, right? 1,400. 1,400 pipes. Excuse oh, me, I was way no off. No wonder they didn't get we, the Yeah, it's no wonder oh, you didn't get the Boy, yeah. Everyone so gets really, a bottle of wine. Everyone gets a bottle of wine, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we need Boy. a new quiz question Different in quiz 30 questions. seconds. So it looks like the costumes will win here. And um, what better way to go into the organ now knowing that there's about a 10% of the pipes I thought there were, um, and, and go from there. So thank you to Kaka'ako Wines and all of our sponsors, and thank you all for, for joining us and continuing to support the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. We'll see you next week. Bill, take it away. Okay.